going to turn this morning in God's Word to the book of 1 John, John's first letter to the community around him. And uh, last week we talked about his theme of walking in the light, and we said one of the things that John does is kind of brings these themes back over and over again. And so we're going to be looking at some of those same themes again this week, but John continues to kind of move us forward also to under try to understand what are the things that hold us together as people who are seeking God, seeking Jesus Christ. 1 John chapter 2, the first 14 verses is our text for this morning. My dear children, John's talking to the church, he also often addresses them as children. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They don't know where they're going. Because the darkness has blinded them. I'm writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends of Jesus, as a pastor, I end up reading a fair amount about mission and vision of a church and ways that churches can communicate these kinds of things so that they sink in to all members of the congregation. And maybe you know, some of you know, that we have a mission and vision statement as a church, and it, we boiled it down to three simple words. Do you know this? Anybody? Come, grow, share. Look at that. It sunk in. So this is good. Uh, it was effective. Those who worked in the mission and vision statement, you can feel, you know, good about that fact. Yeah. I mean, we, we have it on our screens every, every week. We, we put it on the back of our bulletins. We do talk about it periodically. It's just a, a simple way to kind of boil down what are we trying to do as a church into three easy and hopefully memorable words, come, grow, share. And there's all sorts of different ideas in different church publications and periodicals about how to make these things sink in. Develop a better curriculum for new members. Well, that works great but you know, for new members, but that, how does that get out to the rest of us who are here? Uh, we could talk about... Uh, Sermons on, series on church vision, and we've done those once in a while. Newsletter articles, workshops on mission. All of these things are important and in, in a part of communicating what we're all about as a church. But the basic idea behind them, and all churches really have some version of come, grow, share, right? You know, you look at church mission and vision statements, and there's, there's a million of them out there, but there's some version of we want people to come here and understand the love of Jesus and grow in it and be able to be equipped to talk about that, to live it out in the world around them. And the idea behind this is that there are some things that every single one of us in the church ought to know on some level. And it's in that shared knowledge, that shared vision for what we're doing as a community that God works to pull us together. As we said last week, the Apostle John is writing to a church that is facing some conflict. He hasn't quite gotten there yet, but we'll see that later in the letter. 
conflict and division, there's been hurt, there's anxiety. And John really has on his mind a question about vision and mission. And we can almost imagine him asking himself, if I had to communicate one thing to the people around me in the church, if I wanted them to know one message, what would it be? If I had to boil it down to one simple phrase, how would I communicate that? And John comes down actually with, with two things, or we're going to break into two things today. What do we want to know as God's people? We want to know Jesus' life and what it means. And then secondly, we want to know what it means for us. Now, this chapter begins with a simple, what seems to be a statement of purpose that will characterize Christian community. He says in verse 1, I'm writing this to you so that you will not sin. Now, in some ways, I think a lot of people in our world, maybe even a lot of us here, hear that phrase and we say to ourselves, yes, that's the purpose statement of the church, right? It's to keep us from sinning, from doing bad things. Isn't that what the church wants us to know? There are rules and you better follow the rules. But that's not quite what John has in mind by putting this statement in front of us. John turns around and he recognizes the weakness of human nature because in his very next sentence, he acknowledges the reality of sin. But if anyone does sin, I don't want you to sin, but if and when you do, here's what I want you to know. See, the point of the church's ministry and mission, in other words, is not simply good behavior, but rather a means by which we can be forgiven for the wrongs that we have done. The message is about being reconciled with the God of heaven and earth, reconciled with each other. And John wants us quite simply to be familiar with the work of Jesus that accomplishes those things. Now, being with, familiar with the work of Jesus involves an awareness of grace. John says that Jesus is our advocate and our atoning sacrifice for sin. He's our representative before God, in other words, and he is the one who cleanses us from wrong. Now, I think in today's world, that's an easy thing to kind of skirt over. And John's world was very aware of the gods up there, right? You know, there were all sorts of gods, and you, there were all sorts of theories about how to make yourself right with them once again. In our world today, sometimes just acknowledging that there is a God within whom we are, with, with whom we are in relationship is, is a, you know, an accomplishment for the church's message. But John reminds us that this is the most important relationship you or I could have, that it comes down to our relationship with the one who made us who made this world and invites us to be his, his children, his people. And John tells us that forgiveness is real for those who have failed and fallen short of God's glory. If we've ever experienced guilt over something that we've done wrong, or we've ever experienced some sort of restlessness over the people that are around us that we've wronged or hurt, John's telling us that that's a nudge from God. That we need a way to make it right. And our relationship with God begins there, not because we are such good people who deserve God's favor, but for the fact that God is merciful to people who have not earned and cannot earn their own salvation. But then John goes on to say that those who are familiar with the work of Jesus do desire to live in a way that is framed by the, the commands and the instructions of God. They will under, under understand God's will and do what Jesus did. Sin is real, John says, and we need to acknowledge that. But so is our, desi our desire for perfection, our desire to follow God should also be real. A shared vision for the church involves knowing Jesus' commands and carrying them out as they apply to our lives and to our own local witness in the world. We need to know how Jesus walked. Now, when we hear about commands, if you're like me, your natural response is, well, which ones do I really need to listen to, right? Because sometimes it just seems so overwhelming. I mean, there's all these instructions in the Bible, and, and, and they all are important, but, but sometimes it's easier to concentrate on these than on these. Or, or in our world today, we've, we wonder, oh, are some of these out of date? But the short answer is, which commands, as Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, all of them. You and I are called to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. We cannot live in fellowship with God if we are not taking his instructions seriously, John says in verse 4. 
But then the thing I appreciate about John is he goes on to make it clear he's not just putting a bigger list in front of us. Ultimately, the commands, plural, that he talks about in verses 3 and 4 give way to one command in verses 7 and 8. You notice that progression? And that command is basically to walk as Jesus did. To love one another as Jesus loved us. Now again, love is not simply here kind of a sentiment that says, you know, I, I can get along with you, I'll put up with you, or whatever. Love is a way that does have its way of correcting. But it's about how we correct. I may be correct, in other words, to challenge you in your gossip, but if I do it in an angry way, what you're going to experience is my self-righteousness rather than the light of Christ. You may be right sometimes to challenge the church as a whole to do more to care for the poor or to challenge the, the, uh, the forces in our culture today that undermine public morality. But if you do it in a way that talks down to fellow church members, makes them feel like they are less important than you, the focus in the process becomes on you, not on Jesus. And the result in those kinds of cases is more division, not unity in Christ. John tells us one of the important things we do as a church is to explore the commands of God together in a loving way. And if we don't do that, he says, we just get more confused. We try to interpret them for ourselves all the time in a way that pits us against each other. We get confused. Whoever hates his brother or sister, he says, walks in darkness. That person is blind. That person stumbles. We forget where we're going. We won't look for Christ who walks ahead of us and beside us. No, says John, in the church we are called to something else. We are called to a knowledge of God through the practice of his commands as we live them out together. We are called to know how Jesus lived. Now, one of the challenges for church life in the contemporary Western world is we forget why we do things as a church and just go through the motions. Or on the other end of the spectrum, we act as if our behavior doesn't really matter that much as long as we've gone lip service to the atoning sacrifice of Christ on Sunday mornings, or maybe even just on our private devotions. And both approaches damage our witness as followers of Jesus, and they both keep us from knowing the fullness of joy in God's mercy. And this wasn't really about the size of the church or about the number of programs in the community calendar. This is a matter of knowing who we are, why we gather, why we live as we do, what it means to love. I read a book recently that talked about ministry of smaller churches. And one of the stories in that book was about the, sto the story of a woman whose driver's license had been revoked after she'd received multiple DUIs. Now, again, this wasn't the first time. She'd tried a number of recovery programs. She'd been to the courts before, so she knew what they were going to expect of her in order to get her license back. And she had been discouraged by these programs that just hadn't really fixed her problem. But she was in a small town, and she knew of a small church in that town. And so she went to the judge with an unusual request, and she said, what if I get involved in that church? And I have people there who vouch for me that I am involved and and they're working with me as a community. What if? And the judge amazingly granted her request. And the church connected her with an older woman in the congregation who promised that she would meet with this woman every week, check in on her, see how things were going. What temptations? Was she struggling with addiction? And the church it also figured out how they had a couple of people who said, well, we can give you rides to and from, because, of course, you don't have a license right now, and, and we'll help you figure out what you can do with your kids in the meantime. And as the story goes, this woman was dramatically transformed by the network of relationships that she found. A couple decades later, she was still sober. She was still a part of that church, her kids had grown up, and, and they saw the impact that a relationship with Jesus had had on their mother because they saw the impact that a relationship with Jesus had in that church that they took seriously, how Jesus walked and how he loved the people that just came across their path. 
Now, I realize that it doesn't work that way all the time. There are stories, even in this church, of people that we've invested in, individually or as a community, where at least to this point, we haven't seen that kind of, if you will, return on investment. But the thing is that God is not asking us to change the people around us. What he is asking us is to be faithful with the story that he's given. The story of what Jesus has done for us and how we have been forgiven and freed by the sacrifice of Jesus. He invites us, in other words, to know the story. To keep that story front and center in our minds. In the things that we talk about as a church. But he also calls us to have that fit into our lives day by day. And as if to emphasize that point, John addresses the whole community in words of tender delight, explaining how God had been active in developing in them the marks of knowledge and of freedom from the world. And he looks around at the church and he says, in essence, there are some groups that I want to talk to specifically. Dear children, fathers, young men, now, these groups are probably intended to stand in for whole, the whole community, or at least large groups within the community. But I want to conduct a little bit of a thought experiment this morning, and I'll explain in just a minute why. And I want to imagine this morning that you hear John talking to those specific groups, young children. Now, we don't have a lot of young children here, I know that. But there are a few. And if you don't have young children here or your grandchildren aren't here, I want you to imagine for a moment that they are. Young children, do you know that your sins are forgiven because of Jesus? Young children, do you know that you get to know the Heavenly Father? Fathers. And again, I don't think we're just talking to people my age here. I think we're talking to grandfathers, anybody who's ever been a father, maybe anyone who's even been single and, and maybe you don't have kids, but you're that age and people look up to you. Fathers, do you know the one who was from the beginning? Do you think back on your life with the Lord and all the things that you've learned or n known or maybe the things that you wish you knew or are trying to learn? Do you think about your relationship with your Heavenly Father and what that means? Young men. And again, I, I know that this congregation skews older, and so there's not a lot of young men here, but young men. Do you know that you're strong? I mean, you think about the young men in our world today, right? People who are just starting to get, trying to get started in life, and you've seen the statistics. As an article in the New Yorker observes, men are increasingly dropping out of work during their prime working years. They're overdosing. They're drinking themselves to death. They're generally dying earlier. They spend increasing amounts of time on screens rather than socializing. What if that age heard this? You are strong. You have overcome the evil one when you are in Christ. The word of God lives in you. What if those groups heard those things? And yes, I realize we all need to know, men and women, old and young, we all need to know that our sins have been forgiven, that we overcome the evil one, that the word of God lives in us and that we can have an enduring relationship with the Heavenly Father. But as we think about how this talks to particular groups within the church, I want us to think this morning, how do we make those truths come alive for us in particular? whether you're in the, one of those groups or if you're not in one of those groups, how do you help those around you to hear that if they are? How do the women here help the men in their lives take these truths of God's word deep into themselves? How do the kids here help the grown-ups discover the joy of being people who follow Jesus and know that sins can be forgiven? How do those who are older here help those who are younger to know the satisfaction of a lifelong walk with Jesus? Jesus.
I think the direct address to specific members of the congregation in this chapter can help us to remember what it is that God challenges some of us to remember at particular points in life or at particular times in our service to the Lord. Because it's easy at times for us just to go, there are lots of Christian truths and we need to all kind of absorb some of them without ever hearing God speak to us directly. And yet part of the goal of the Christian life is to have God speak through his word and spirit to us directly. And part of our goal as Christian community is to recognize that there are things that God is saying to all of us and to figure out how do we help each other listen to the voice of God and to the word of God and apply it faithfully as we serve him day by day. And how would our congregation be changed, reshaped, as we seek to do that more and more? And I realize some of this is happening already. There are people who are mentoring and mentored and there are people who speak to each other about the truths of the Christian faith. How do we grow in that? How do we have God open our eyes to ways that we can keep talking more and more about these things? As question and answer 21 of the Keitelberg Catechism puts it, the wonder of faith is that not only we discover that not only others, but I too have had my sins forgiven, have been made right, forever right with God and been granted salvation. How do we see that not just as a theoretical truth, but as something that all of us want to hand on to those around us so that together we have something to hand on to the world beyond these walls? See, in this generation in particular, I think we live in a world of isolation where we're all trying to do it ourselves. And so one of the great challenges is to stick together and reminding one another of the truths that we all should know. Truths that maybe sometimes we do know and we assent to intellectually, but we forget how to apply them to ourselves personally. I love how John puts himself in the story here. Maybe you noticed that. John isn't writing a letter as somebody who's made it in the Christian life and now he's 90 years old or whatever he is in tradition, you know, in the tradition as he's writing this letter and saying, you need to discover that you need forgiveness. No, John says that Jesus is the sacrifice for our sins, your sins and my sins. And because he's the sacrifice for our sins, we're learning more how to love each other. Our love for each other is not rooted in mere humanistic sentiment, but in the knowledge that we have been forgiven much ourselves. There's another story I ran across recently. It's the story of two lawyers in the same firm who, even though they worked for the same company, were fierce rivals and critics of each other. And over the years, they managed to find plenty of ways to get little digs and hurt each other and step on each other's toes. And one day, one of the lawyers went on a church retreat. And he became convicted of his own need for salvation. He understood the grace of Jesus in a new way. And he realized that the grace of Jesus had something to do with his relationship with his colleague. And at first he said, well, you know, I, I think what I need to do is I need to go and forgive him. Because he's wronged me. He said lots of mean and hurtful things to me. And I need to, need to know that I forgave him. But as he wrestled with that a little bit more, and he talked to his pastor and a couple other people about it, he realized that that really wasn't what he needed. Because in his forgiving his colleague, he wasn't really taking any ownership himself for his own sin. And so instead, he went the following week, and he knocked on his colleague's door. And he said, I need to have a word with you. And I know that we've had our differences over the years. But something happened to me that changed my life. I've discovered what it really means to follow Jesus. And I realized that in our disagreements, I've said things, and I've mischaracterized your statements, and I've tried to undermine you. And I just want you to know that I'm sorry for that. And because I've been forgiven by Jesus, I want to seek your forgiveness also. And his colleague was blown away by this. He says, this is not the guy I thought I, I knew. I've worked with you for a long time. Something obviously happened. And he talked about it. He says, I, yes, I'll forgive you, but, but there's something that I want to know. Is it possible for me to get what you have? 
See, what happened is this man's testimony was so astounding because it was personal, because the love of Jesus was something that, that he had taken in personally, and it affected the way that he lived around him. And it's that same witness to Jesus that we are called to live out as a community. The personal awareness of the gospel message brings us together in witness to Jesus. John Newton is the author of Amazing Grace, the song. He is quoted as saying as he got older, there's a lot of things I've forgotten in life. My memory is not as good as it used to be, but there's two things that I still know for sure. One is that I am a great sinner. And two is that Jesus Christ is a great Savior. And I think as we listen to what John has to say to us today about the truths that we all should know, that's a pretty good way to boil it down. We are people who are called to holiness, called to live out the message of salvation, the commands that God has given us. We're sinners. And so even as we seek to do that with all of our heart, we're going to fall short. But we understand that we can be forgiven. And we understand that the word of God dwells in us. We understand the love that God has for us in our own situation in life. And we encourage others to see that for themselves. We discover how much we have in common. And as we discover how much we have in common as forgiven sinners, people just trying to live out a life in response to the grace of God, we might be surprised how much we find ourselves united in common vision for the work of the church for the work of this community in which God has placed us. Let's pray.